Welcome back to RSVP, when we talk about how it is that we respond and serve our vocations in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, Sister, I want to continue talking about uh, a little bit overcoming these obstacles that a mm -hmm. lot of us have right. uh, mm -hmm. in, in our vocations, just because I think that we all have them, that we all experience them in our, in our lives, and I don't want to just kind of gloss over them and say, oh, like, we'll, we'll just pray. So, you know, what if, if there's somebody out there, like, mm -hmm. right now that right. is saying, okay, like, that's great. You tell me to pray, but, but what does that look like? How do I do it? Yeah, there's a lot of noise in my life. How do I escape that? You know, right. I don't know. Like, and you know, you just become this big, you know, merry-go-round of dizziness of thought. You know, that's right. kind of exactly. plummeting around. So, mm -hmm. so if there's just somebody out there that just today is saying, okay, well, how do I begin right. discernment? Mm -hmm. what, what would you say to that person? They will make that choice. Turn off the TV, or what? What do you? Where do you find yourself spending all that extra time? Uh, computer? Are you texting all the time? Again, just making that space for quiet and get yourself in front of the Eucharist. Mm. Um, you know, if you're close to a church or a chapel on campus or to make that time for silence and start that relationship with Jesus. Or, you know, when's the last time you open up the Bible? Get the scripture out. The Lord speaks to us in mm. so many different ways. So how do you begin? Just by making that choice. Pick up a Bible, open it up, get yourself in front of the Eucharist, go to Mass, um, the sacraments, reconciliation. Really. You know, there's something, and this is just popped into my brain while you were talking, but about like authentic relationships mm -hmm. and kind of inauthentic relationships and I think even like authentic communication yeah. mm -hmm. and non-authentic communication that mm -hmm. in a way I think that sometimes we really have a lack of true intimacy yeah. mm -hmm. maybe like in our relationships because we can friend somebody on Facebook right like, well, what does yeah. what does that mean you yeah. know uh, you know I, I click a button and mm -hmm. that means I'm your friend you know like uh, but we hesitate to walk next door and and know the neighbor that, that we that we live with or whatnot. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of times too, uh, we can reduce God to that. You know, like mm -hmm. oh yeah, like well, I'd friend Jesus on Facebook. Right. You know, but <laughs> but do I actually know him? Exactly. You know, and do I actually uh, talk to him? Right. And mm -hmm. and I think that I, I often tell people I say you know if you start with you know dear God and end with Amen, that's a pretty good prayer. Whatever mm -hmm. comes up in the middle, right. you know. And mm -hmm. um, I think it was. Uh, John Vianney that said, uh, you know, it's, it's heart speaks to heart, yes. you know, mm -hmm. uh, when, he, when he talked about prayer and really mm -hmm. just having that um, open dialogue that the Lord doesn't look for us to be perfect in prayer no. either, no. Uh, but just to, to spend time right. um, listening and, and just sharing mm -hmm. our heart with Him. Right, simply speaking to mm -hmm. Him. It doesn't have to be a formal prayer. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be um, what you think it should be, but it's what's on your heart? What are the questions that you have? Is it am I ready to be open to what he wants or simply loving him, mm -hmm. simply being with him? Um, it's okay to be silent. And it's and to also in our world, because we expect that immediate response, um, God doesn't always work that way either. We may ask him today, Lord, what's my vocation? But he may not respond most likely. Mm -hmm. It's going to take time and we have to be patient with his answer as well. And I think that the amazing thing that I've even seen in some of the young people's lives uh, that I've been blessed to, to work with is just as we were talking about how, okay, you sit down at the computer and say, oh, well, I'm just going to check my email. It's just right. going to be five minutes. Mm -hmm. and then five minutes turns into a half an hour, exactly. to one hour, two hours. Right. And what happens is then they feel drained yeah. at mm -hmm. the end of that and, right. and really just this kind of emptiness. Mm -hmm. um, but what's amazing is that when you start to see them pray, yes. yeah. and that mm -hmm. five minutes turns into ten minutes, right. turns into a half an hour, exactly. turns into a full holy hour that, that they're doing, right. and instead of feeling drained mm -hmm. at the end of it, mm -hmm. they're more alive. Right. And, and, full of and, life. Oh, mm -hmm. full of life and, and so vibrant. Mm -hmm. And um, that again, I think that to start small and not yes. to say, uh, I'm going to run a spiritual marathon right, right, right. off the bat, mm -hmm. but to say, you know, uh, I can do five minutes. Right. What, yeah, start small. What's one thing today that I can mm -hmm. do? Don't have to have ten, right, mm -hmm. sister? Um, so now that we've talked about the um, what a vocation is, you know, the, the call that Christ gives each one of us, exactly. uh, mm -hmm. universally and individually, mm -hmm. as well as some of the fears and obstacles. Um, sure. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share just some of like your own story, because obviously, a young person would see you walking down the street and think, right. "Well, there's a lady that obviously, you know, heard the voice uh, of God in some way," and sure. um, so. Maybe speak a little bit about your own vocation story sure. and, and how you mm -hmm. overcame some of those obstacles right. yourself. How did it happen? Right. Um, well, I grew up in California, and I have two younger sisters, so family, um, parents. And actually, second grade was the first time I ever thought about religious life. I had sisters that taught me in grade school, high school, and there was something about them. You know, 
don't you enjoy being around people who are joyful Absolutely. and happy? Sure, sure. So there's something that drew me mm -hmm. there. And then when I was in sixth grade, they um, had a day where we could go visit the convent. And they all taught within the Archdiocese of L.A. And so I actually was the only one who went from my class, <laughs> which was a little scary. But at the same time, there was something that I wanted to know more about. Mm -hmm. And so then I just started writing one of the sisters. Um, again, pre-internet days or pre-email, but um, again, just asking those questions that were on my heart. How did you know? The same things that people ask me, well, how did you know, sister? I wanted to know from this, from this one sister. Well, well. So then I continued to um, talk to her throughout the rest of junior high and high school. And I guess throughout these years, too, I, d I struggled a lot with just friendships. So that's when Jesus really became that friend that I knew would always be there. So I would say, again, we were talking about that relationship personal relationship with Jesus really kind of started mm -hmm. uh, to deepen. And then when I was a senior in high school, it was, do I, again, that choice of college, religious life, like, which, where's God calling me to be? And as a senior in high school, the, the church actually was just across the parking lot from the high school. And oh. my two younger sisters would get out later than I did. So many days I would just walk over to the church and just sit there and say, Lord, what do you want? What are you calling me to? What's the answer? And it didn't come right away. And I wouldn't say it was a direct um, either. You know, it was just more of a transformation of my heart. And I mm -hmm. felt like, well, actually, I remember this sister saying, this is a love relationship with Jesus. I thought, that's what I desire, mm -hmm. but I'm not there yet. And so I felt like I needed to go to college um, to learn more about myself, learn more about who I was, develop this relationship with the Lord a little bit more. And so I went to college mm -hmm. and loved it. Um, my mom called me up one year, or no, I guess a few months after I started college, and she asked me, have you thought about religious life, or how's it going? And I said, no, no, Mom, I'm, I'm really okay. You know, I'm enjoying college. This is great. And I was being very defensive, very, I didn't want to look at it. You know, that resistance mm -hmm. was there. And she said, as a mother, she felt that if she saw a vocation in her child, that she should encourage it. And the fact that I was being defensive, maybe I had one. Mm. It's like, oh, <laughs> I didn't. I, I wanted to hang up that phone pretty quickly, but it mm -hmm. stuck with me. And you know, and just talking about you know parents, she seeing something in her daughter um, and encouraging it in a very gentle way, but really, even though I was resistant to it at the time, um, really stuck to me because again, when we're peaceful about something, we can talk about it. Right. But when there's something going on in our heart, many times we're like, ah, oh, I don't want to look because there might be something there. Uh, so I continued throughout college. Um, I heard about a ministry where I could serve the church. It was Catholic, travel, retreats. I thought, oh, I can do this and not be a sister. I can still serve the church and not be a sister. So I decided to do that after I entered or finished college. Hmm. So I graduated, and um, you know, the next day after I took my finals, flew out to Minnesota and started traveling across the country, giving retreats to high school wow. students, which was an amazing experience with just growing in my faith. Learning, again, that d the importance of daily prayer, the sacraments, Eucharistic adoration for the first time, um, traveling with a team, really experiencing community life that way, what it means to really serve and mm -hmm. to uh, make those sacrifices and really knowing I needed God to get up every day to serve. So it was in that year that one of my teammates was thinking about religious life, and I thought, oh. I found myself a little jealous of her because she was actually thinking about it. Mm. And it brought back everything that I had thought about before. So after that year um, and meeting, she's the one that introduced me to the Sisters of St. Francis of the Martyr St. George in Alton, Illinois. And I thought, where's Alton, Illinois? Coming from California to the Midwest. And uh, so she brought me there for a day. And I remember talking to the vocation director and knowing deep down that I'd probably be back. But I was dating and I was moving on. I was still going to serve another year with the ministry, but there was something there that kind of like sparked, but it was pretty low. Like I wasn't paying attention too much to it. So I moved to Minnesota. Um, I ended the dating relationship. And after that, it was really the question in prayer. Was that no that I said in high school, a no just for then or a no for forever? And really saying, okay, Lord, if you're calling me, I'll go. If not, let's move on. But I, I didn't want to think, what if? What if you were calling me and I didn't pay attention? So I wrote different communities, got information. Again, that struggle between religious life, married life. At one point, I saw the challenges of both. said, forget it. I don't want either one. But I, again, we talked about the Lord showing us the beauty of both mm -hmm. vocations. So the, real, the Lord changing my heart in that, seeing the gift of both vocations um, and that surrender to him. You know, Because it takes surrender 
to what he wants. And I remember I visited the sisters after um, the Lord, during Lent, actually, I loved sleep. So Lent, I was going to get up to go to Mass every day. And uh, by the end of Lent, I couldn't imagine my life without going to Mass every day. That's how he could transform, too. But I had been more drawn to go pray in front of the crucifix. And when I got the letter from the vocation director, I still remember opening it up, the Thursday after Easter, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. It's our charism to receive Christ's merciful love and to make it visible. Oh my goodness, this is where I've been drawn this whole time to go pray in front of the crucifix, the one I had pierced. So I knew I had to go visit this community. Um, So I did. Laughed so much the whole weekend. The joy of the sisters is being with them, the love for the church, love for the prayer, um, praying the stations of the cross every day, the rosary, um, just being with them, the wide variety of apostolates that we have of nursing and teaching care for retired priests, a daycare center. So I really, to make his merciful love visible in the church really drew me, the charism. Mm -hmm. And I remember, again, the Eucharist is really the source of my vocation. That's where the Lord spoke to me the most, is in front of his presence. And I remember being in our adoration chapel saying, okay, Lord, this is great. You know, the sisters are so joyful, but why? Why would they come and do this? And I was not expecting an answer. But immediately, the words, eternal life, came into my mind Mm. and I knew that that was not from me so I said okay Lord that's pretty good pretty good reason because it wasn't him asking me to just give up my my family in California or my friends in Minnesota or what my future would be he was inviting me to give him everything Mm. in order to gain everything eternal life so that was one visit came back again and again really a step of faith I felt at home there there was a peace a deep peace and again, the Lord leads us so far, and then he says, will you trust me? Um, and so I said, okay, yes, yes to where you want me to be. Um, takes a surrender, and it's a continual surrender. That's not just, that was the first mm-hmm. the beginning, but it's again, we talked about it's an everyday choice, an everyday yes to follow him. Well, so. what, a great, what a great journey, mm-hmm. again, you know, that we, we talk about how, sure, you had some exposure to the sisters as a, as a very young woman in grade school, mm-hmm. Um, and how gently and patiently right. uh, the Lord guides us, yes. walks with us, mm-hmm. uh, and, and calls us, and that um, each day has enough concern for its own. And so right. I think the Lord does. He even says, you know, uh, when you said in high school, Lord, what are you calling me to do? And you say, right. well, there's no direct answer right at that moment. Yeah. But uh, maybe at that moment, it's just, just be still. Like, exactly. it, just be you, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. uh, to have the opportunity to um, go to college, have an, a, a natural college experience and then yep. social life. You know, I think mm-hmm. that one thing that, you know, people need to remember is that, you know, priests and sisters, we don't fall off trees. You know, right, like, right, we're, we're not right. grown in some sort of like a little spiritual cabbage patch or something, <laughs> right. you know, that, uh, exactly. that, that we're all normal people and we yeah. all have uh, our own families and our, and our own talents and abilities, our own stories, yes. you know, and, mm-hmm. and everything else. So, uh, well, thanks for sharing that. Yes. Uh, we'll come back with more with Sister Consolata uh, and her own vocation story and her religious community. Mm-hmm. Um, when we come back with more of RSVP.